Christina. Hi folks, uh, for everyone that's on so far, we're just going to give it a few more minutes. We're just slightly uh, ahead of schedule there, which waiting slightly after seven o'clock. Hi folks, we're just going to give it one more minute um, for any latecomers to come on. We're, we're nearly ready to begin, so just uh, one or two more minutes, please. Okay, folks, we're just at uh, two minutes past seven by my watch there. So I think we'll maybe just kick off and if any other latecomers come on, they, 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 can, uh, they can follow up just as we're going. Um, just by introduction, uh, you're all very welcome to this NIAS webinar this evening. My name is Peter McCann. I'm the, the, the chair of NIAS, the Northern Ireland Institute of Agricultural Science. Um, just background to myself, I'm uh, the day job, I'm a Northern Ireland correspondent with the Irish Farmers Journal, and I'm also uh, farming in uh, Lamavari in North County Dairy, uh, sheep and suckers. Um, just, uh, I know from, from the list, we have uh, several people on tonight who actually aren't uh, members of NIAS, just by background, it's a professional organisation for, for people working in the agri-food industry in Northern Ireland. So it's, it's made up of a, a wide range of people in different, working in different fields. Uh, like journalists and farmers like myself, the bankers, civil servants, researchers, scientists, uh, a, a wide spectrum of people. So these are all uh, very welcome to this evening's event. So we're talking mitigating methane uh, lessons from New Zealand. And I'm delighted to say we have two speakers uh, this evening coming live from uh, coronavirus free New Zealand, uh, <laughs> Mark Aspen and Dr. Peter Jansen. Um, just, I suppose, uh, but background maybe for our two speakers and perhaps for anyone who isn't just really familiar with the topic in Northern Ireland. Uh, in, in Northern Ireland, the latest figures that, that I could see from DARA suggest that uh, agriculture accounts for 27% of greenhouse gas emissions in Northern Ireland and methane uh, equates or uh, is responsible for about 65% of those emissions from agriculture. Um, those calculations from what I can gather are under the Global Warming Potential 100 system. Um, and so if we use the some of the work that we've done in the Farmer's Journal in recent months, 
has been looking at the system that's used in the University of Oxford, um, the GWP star, and it does give a different uh, impression of that in fairness. Um, we would suggest that it's reduced it by almost 500 times. Um, and that's effectively because the Northern Ireland cattle herd hasn't actually uh, been increasing. Um, in fact, it's actually reduced by 6.2% over the last 20 years, uh, 1.72 million head in 1989 to 1.6 million head last year. Um, we're not here to talk about different systems of counting greenhouse gases. What we're here really to talk about this evening is steps we can take uh, to mitigate, to mitigate uh, methane and uh, all the, uh, the global warming effect that effectively has. On to our two speakers this evening, they're going to kind of go at the same time take in, in, in terms of speaking. So we're going to have a presentation from, from Mark and Peter and then question and answer session. So if I can ask, uh, just through, throughout, as they're speaking, feel free to, to bounce questions through, preferably the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, not chat, uh, Q&A, it's better for us if you can. So feel free to bounce them in as, as, as we go along. And then also at the, at the end too, we can take questions at, at, at any time after the presentations are finished. Background to the two speakers, Mark Aspen, he's general manager of the Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium. He's coming to us this evening from Wellington. Um, his organization aims to provide knowledge and tools for New Zealand farmers so they can mitigate greenhouse gas emissions from the agriculture sector. The PGGRC is funded by eight New Zealand uh, agriculture sector partners and works in collaboration with the New Zealand government. It's founded in 2002 and its programs uh, for mitigating methane through animal genetics, low greenhouse gas emission feeds, livestock vaccination, and other inhibiting compounds. Um, coming from Palmerston from North is Dr. Peter Jansen from AgriSearch New Zealand. Peter coordinates different work streams to develop technologies to reduce methane emissions from ruminants. Um, his research has found that across a variety of diets and species, the majority of rumen microbes are largely the same. And to me, this is interesting because it would suggest that whatever works in New Zealand will certainly work in Northern Ireland. So that's enough for me. Very uh, happy to have two speakers here and uh, a kick off. I think with Mark, do you want to go first? So uh, welcome. Um, to our presentation. I'm, uh, uh, my name is Mark Aspen and uh, we're coming from Aotearoa, New Zealand. So uh, looking forward to talking through what we've been doing. Oh, crikey, it's, uh, man, it's 17 years, I suppose, we've been trying to nail this one. So um, hopefully we'll have some interesting uh, bits and pieces for you to, to, to see as we go. So a little bit of context to open up New Zealand. Um, we are a very solid, uh, you know, ninety percent agricultural of our agricultural commodities industries uh, are exported. We're a land of twenty-seven million uh, hectares in total, but grazing land where our ruminants roam is ten million, and of that ten million, about two and a half million is in dairy land, and the rest of it's in sheep and beef and. Uh, I heard you calling them sucklers, but we tend to call them sheep and beef uh, here in New Zealand. Um, and the graph that's up in front of you has come from us from the Beef and Lamb Economic Service. Um, just shows you since 1990, our change in, in the uh, agricultural mix uh, that we've had in our land. Uh, back in 1990, we had just under 60 million sheep. We're now down about uh, 26, 27 million sheep uh, in our national flock. Our beef numbers were kind of near four and a half million and now they're just under four million. And our dairy herd went from a point of about three and a half million in 1990 to being uh, in total of about six, uh, 6.4 million uh, today of about five, of about five million cows and milk. Um, so <clears throat> that's the sort of context of our agricultural industry. And in the, in the, um, and in, the, and in this discussion, uh, that means that our New Zealand greenhouse gas inventory um, and profile is quite unique in the developed world. Um, 
due to that uh, ruminant and due to our lack of major manufacturing and industry kind of uh, in our economy, um, 48 or 47.8 percent of our emissions comes from agriculture. The split uh, in the sense of the sectors, and we talk, we talk about the dairy and uh, sheep and beef as kind of sectors, um, is about a 50-50 split. It's about 40, it is more or less 50, that 13% from beef, 37% or so from sheep, and about just under 50% from the dairy industry. We do have a deer industry uh, as well, um, and they contribute about one, one and a half percent of the total emissions. And of those agricultural emissions, uh, 80%, 80, 75 to 80% is methane, uh, with the balance being nitrous oxide um, from our free grazing systems. There is very few housed uh, farming systems in New Zealand. There's a few more than there used to be, but uh, it's by way a very small niche market of housing. Uh, our animals graze outside all year round and we farm them that way. Um, that does mean that we have urine being deposited on the soils, and so we do have nitrous oxide to contend with, um, and it makes up about uh, 20 to 25 percent of our total emissions. Um, so that's the mix and the background in the sense of uh, what the challenge we have. Um, on top of that, we have some, as most uh, countries in the United Nations do have these days, um, policy and targets for greenhouse gas reduction. Under the Paris uh, agreement, our commitment was to reduce emissions by 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. That's at an economy level, that's not agriculture, that's, that's the overall New Zealand economy. Um, and in terms of our national domestic agricultural targets um, and methods for dealing with greenhouse gas emissions, um, we've had an emissions trading scheme since around 2007. Uh, that scheme is all gases, all sectors, but uh, agriculture has not been uh, paying uh, directly for its non-CO2 emissions in the emissions trading scheme. Um, we'll come back to that in our last slide, but uh, we've sat outside that because uh, simply there is not very many options open for New, for New Zealand farmers to be able to reduce their emissions on from coming from their farm businesses. Uh, so there was not a lot of incentive. Uh, this, earlier this year, the uh, current government passed the Zero Carbon Act, which has uh, refreshed our, our approach to uh, greenhouse gas and climate change. And now under that act, we've got some new targets. The net emissions of carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide to go to zero by 2050. Um, and in our legislation, we've split the gases. And so methane has a separate target. Uh, is in the, the current targets, which are being reviewed uh, <clears throat> over the next little while, uh, methane to reduce to 10% below 2017 levels by 2030, and a bracketed 24 to 47% below 2017 by 2050. Uh, and for the industry people and the farmers on this, a bracket of 24 to 47% uh, has got all of our local industry quite concerned because there's a hell of a big difference between 47 and 24 if you've got to change your farming industry. But we are talking 2050. So plenty of contention, plenty of discussion uh, around those targets. Um, under the Act, we also have created a UK-style uh, climate commission that will set and review five yearly emission budgets and monitor the governance progress. And the current job of the uh, <clears throat> newly um, created commission is to set the first five-year budget uh, and currently as the legislation says in the point above 10 percent. I don't think that's going to change but the uh, 24, 47 May but they are they are working and advising on that now. So that's kind of the context of <clears throat> the land, <coughs> our country, our agricultural industry, the emissions and what our targets are in New Zealand. Um, just a little bit of background because Peter and I will drop in and out of acronyms a little bit um, and so just kind of to give you a little bit of a feel of how we operate uh, our agricultural greenhouse gas mitigation research approach here in New Zealand. There's kind of two organisations and sitting in the screen there, the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre and the Pastoral Greenhouse Gas Research Consortium 
whom I uh, lead. Um, both of those received government funding. Um, as uh, Peter noted in my intro, um, we match, uh, we being the uh, livestock industry, so the dairy, uh, sheep and beef, deer, and the fertilizer industry, match dollar for dollar with the Ministry of Business and Innovation and, Develop and Employment. And that's our science vote uh, in, in the terms, I'm not sure what your ministries are called in, in the UK, but that's the science vote. We put up a dollar, they match it one, and so we double our money and we, we invest into our research programs, 5.2 million of New Zealand dollars per annum. Um, our partners, and, and we are a member of the Greenhouse Centre, um, the NZAGRC, uh, receives its money from not only from the Ministry of Business and Innovation and Employment, but also from the Ministry for Primary Industries. And they have a, a, a slightly bigger budget uh, these days, 9.7 million New Zealand dollars per annum. And collectively, and certainly in methane, a uh, little less than some of the other areas of uh, nitrous oxide and soil carbon, uh, which we're not talking to today, but uh, we work collectively with the Greenhouse Centre to, uh, to deliver uh, options and opportunities for the sector. So those will be the acronyms you might hear us talk about throughout it. Um, it's always been, a, in, our, in our view, it's always been a three-way uh, um, collaboration required here. Um, in many respects, uh, all the players, we are the industry, our ruminant farm businesses create the emissions that we're going to try to reduce. Uh, New Zealand as a country has got responsibilities internationally and so government is totally involved uh, in, in making sure and, and helping us to uh, meet those targets and, and keep our, our free trade and, and all our opportunities open. And this is a biological challenge. And so science is immediately uh, in the forefront of trying to solve the challenges of methane and nitrous oxide. Those three players have to work together. We always have worked together. And if they don't, uh, we will never get the, the most, uh, the slickest uh, and the best um, solutions to this. Um, and as New Zealanders, we seem to be able to manage that um, and still have our own autonomy for each of those three groups from time to time. Um, just a little bit of background to the uh, PGGRC. You've heard a little bit of this, so I'll be quick. Um, you already heard our purpose to, to provide knowledge and tools for New Zealand farmers. Uh, we are very focused on delivering for New Zealand farmers firstly and foremostly. Um, we know our ruminant systems are unique to New Zealand, but then they're very much similar to others. So uh, we think we do have some global opportunities as well. We have a memorandum of understanding with the government since 2003 to support greenhouse gas mitigation research. So it's a 17 year partnership. Um, over that time, we've put over $80 million into this kind of research um, of our, we've directed $80 million. So, you know, 40 million of that has come from farmers. Uh, 40 million from the government alongside it. Uh, the consortium owns all the intellectual property that we deliver and we look after that on behalf of New Zealand farmers. We always have partner and we're developing solutions for all livestock. So you'll see results talking about sheep, but really our eye is on all our livestock um, and we try and do our work as efficiently as we can to drive um, those solutions to all. And our New Zealand model, we've not seen elsewhere globally. We see partnerships, but the farmers being in the boot, right in the middle of the camp here and really involved uh, is something, I, I think we're pretty proud of that. And um, it's got its challenges, but I think it's a pretty cool model. So, um, <coughs> and uh, just the challenge of livestock methane, um, Methane production from partially farmed ruminants is directly proportional to the quantity of feed consumed. So with little variation for pasture species, feed quality and animal type, it's all about how much they eat, really 85% of the variation. System efficiencies, you know, um, greenhouse gas per kilogram of product and everything are really important and running an efficient business is very important, but it doesn't have a massive effect on gross emissions. Um, and so it's not your way out when you've got a 10%, 27%, 47% kind of target reduction. Efficiency is not going to get you there. Um, you've got to reduce your total amount of emissions. And New Zealand pastoral farmers have few management uh, options. 
uh, to de decouple emissions of methane. And so our mission in the, in the consortium and in the centre is to provide those decoupling solutions. And so that's what the rest. In the next slide, I think I pass to Peter. So over to you, Peter. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, my name is Peter Jansen. I work at uh, an organisation called Ag Research. So we're one of the uh, research providers for the PGGRC and the NZAGRC. Uh, we have um, been working with the PGGRC for the last 17 years. Initially, um, the work was involved in trying to understand where the methane was coming from and developing all the techniques. Uh, a lot of things weren't out there, so we had to start from scratch. We find that all the time, a lot of going back to basics. But we've always had our eye on developing technologies that can be used in our pastoral uh, agricultural industries. So with a real eye on reality and will it work and can it work in a farming system in, uh, in New Zealand anyway. And so at the moment, we've got four main technologies. We've got a couple of others bubbling under, but they're not advanced enough yet to, to really tell you too much about. But these are our four major technologies that we've been uh, looking at uh, over, well, from 10 to 17 years, I suppose. Uh, one of them, so the, the blue box is a, is a representation of the rumen and uh, feed is ingested by the animal and that feed is in, uh, fermented in the rumen by this very complex community of uh, microorganisms, some thousand species or more, they represented by those uh, brown ovals. And it's the products of uh, that fermentation that provides a lot of the energy and nutrition for the uh, ruminant animal for its uh, survival and growth and for the products that we uh, gain from those animals. And one of the byproducts of that fermentation is hydrogen gas. And that hydrogen gas is a good energy source for another group of microbes that are able to survive in there and use that hydrogen to convert to methane. And of course, it's the methane that we're trying to uh, reduce the amount of methane that's formed from that initial feed. And so our technologies are to find feeds that result in less hydrogen being formed so that you get less methane. That's our low GHG feeds. Always keeping an eye on that. You can't trade off uh, one gas for another and get more nitrous oxide, but save a bit of methane. That might not get you very far. Can you change the way that the rumen functions by selecting, genetically selecting for animals that have a different type of rumen morphology or physiology uh, so that the processes are different and you get a different amount of hydrogen and therefore a different amount of methane? Or can you directly inhibit those methane producing microbes via vaccinating the animals or by providing a compound that specifically inhibits just those organisms and nothing else in the rumen? Next slide, Mark. So I'll just go through uh, the uh, four technologies with a slide on each and in between Mark, we'll just tell you a little bit about some of the equipment that we have. Um, so one of the most advanced uh, technologies is, uh, is breeding. Uh, we've done, done a lot of work in sheep and I think uh, we're quite proud of that. And the knowledge from that is just being rolled out into, uh, into cattle now. We started with sheep because they're easier to work with and so, um, whoa, <laughs> they're easy to work with. And uh, we were able to prove a lot of the concepts that we needed to and understand what was going on. So um, we found, it was very important, we found out that it is heritable, a low methane trait in sheep is heritable and its uh, heritability is similar to other production traits, which uh, makes it very promising for introducing into the national flock. And importantly, it's maintained across the different seasons as the animal ages and also if the animal is fed different diets. So it's permanent effect on the animal. We've bred for experimental purposes, uh, two lines of sheep. We've deliberately selected for sheep that produce consistently higher methane than the average and consistently lower methane than the average. And that difference is about 11% 
and our current low line produces about 6% less methane than the national average. Um, how, that's after about, because the way that um, breeding works, it's a bit over three generations of uh, selection. Um, how low the yield can go is something we don't know, and that will require um, ongoing work. You just have to keep breeding and, and see how it goes. Importantly, we've seen that there are no differences really, apart from methane, between the high and the low methane animals, which is very encouraging for uh, farmers who were, would be willing to take up this uh, technology. For example, the, the number of live lambs, um, daily live weight gain, things like that, uh, are not compromised by being a low methane animal. Um, the whole process of genetic selection is already used by um, farmers in New Zealand, uh, be it for sheep or, or for cattle. So um, it's readily taken up into the industry and there are mechanisms via genomic uh, selection that farmers can select for the different traits they're interested in and methane can be one of those traits. So it will be part of the farmer's daily business of um, improving their flock. It does require some uh, infrastructure. As, we, as I said before, you would want an ongoing training population that's ahead of the industry to look out for that point where, you know, if it did happen, that some point that uh, <coughs> gone too far. And uh, also we use um, portable accumulation chambers that Mark will just talk about in a minute, which are mobile and can go onto the farm and actually monitor the progress on the farm. We don't, we're not going to be measuring every single sheep in New Zealand, but the idea is to keep the genomic uh, selection markers up to date so that uh, through the uh, genomic um, profiling of flocks, you can see which, where each flock is at. Um, and the traits actually being rolled out at the moment this year um, with COVID uh, lockdown caused a little bit of a, a delay, but it's out again. And we've got a pilot group of ram breeders who are um, having their flocks measured or their rams measured and uh, get an idea of which are the high and low methane animals and get an idea of how this whole thing will work. Uh, next slide, Mark, back to you. Yeah, and so just uh, on your left uh, of the slide is a what's a, a portable accumulation chamber or a pack chamber as, as we call them. Um, our extensive work in the background of this, we selected 13, uh, over three or four years, we put 1,300 uh, sheep through uh, respiratory chambers and, and that's how we got very accurate methane measurements. Now that, that wealth of data has enabled us to be able to slip to uh, confirm that uh, if you take a one hour uh, period of time and you measure three times uh, the methane um, in isolation with individual animals, you can actually estimate the amount of um, methane, the methane breeding value. And so that is the phenotype we use um, I do believe somewhere in Ireland there is one of these trailers wandering around somewhere. Uh, may not be, may not be in the northern Ireland part, but I think it is in Ireland. Um, but yeah, so we use pack chambers. The photo on our left, uh, on sorry, on the right there is um, Peter and, and uh, a visitor looking at our respiratory chambers, and we've got 24 respiratory chambers set up in Agri Research in Palmerston North uh, for sheep and four for cattle. And um, so those are kind of really critical infrastructures to be able to do some work here. If we didn't have those 24 chambers, you wouldn't be looking at a pack chamber um, for sure. On the, on the cattle side, and while we're talking about breeding, uh, we've been focused on doing it with sheep because we've got the infrastructure to really drive it. And the challenge in cattle, we think the trait will be in cattle, uh, is actually finding ways to measure and be able to accurately do that. Uh, so we've got kind of two uh, methane measurement facilities for cattle in New Zealand. Um, the gentleman on your left standing beside us, that's actually a um, feed intake, uh, residual feed intake kit that's got a green feed um, uh, methane measurement as, uh, associated with it. We have seven of those at uh, Dairy NZ in Hamilton. Um, the gentleman there at the time was, was their lead scientist, but now he's the chief science um, advisor for the uh, Ministry for Primary Industries. He's an Irishman by the name of John Roach. So there you are, there's a little bit of the old country there. 
Um, on the right hand side uh, is one of our chambers where we've got feed bins inside a chamber for cattle. So we have four of those uh, in our situation in New Zealand. There are plans afoot to expand the number of respiratory chambers, which every six minutes gives you a very accurate measure of the uh, total emissions that are passing through and coming out of ruminants. Back to you, Peter. Okay, so as well as breeding, one of the other areas that we've been interested in is the, the feed base. So we know that, um, oh, we've gone one too far, Mark. Sorry so uh, we know that uh, the biggest driver of uh, methane is the amount of uh, feed that's eaten. So pretty much you get a certain amount of methane per kilogram of dry matter intake uh, for pasture. And uh, everyone was hoping that if you could manage your pastures well and get a higher quality pasture that you would uh, reduce the amount of methane. Um, that's not the case. The, the amount of methane per kilogram of dry matter intake doesn't uh, change as significantly with changes of uh, the pasture quality. So you might get more production, but uh, you don't get less uh, methane per kilogram of dry matter intake, which is the basis of the measures in New Zealand. So that's what our uh, inventory is based on. So. We do know that feeds can reduce methane and grain has long uh, been known to reduce methane. You can get a, about a reduction of about 50% if you feed animals grain. Uh, grains are just not part of our uh, system. It's not part of our widespread system anyway. Um, and there's no plans to change to that in New Zealand. Our climate's probably not really suited for growing grain on that type of scale. Um, but it does show that you can inter, uh, intervene via a feed. So we've looked across our feed base and we've looked at things like high sugar grasses, different types of silage, um, what happens if you have more clover in the diet, um, alternative uh, feeds like chicory that are, um, have periodic uh, um, enthusiasm amongst our farmers because they offer other advantages. Uh, supplements that are used in the New Zealand industry like um, palm kernel expeller, which is a, a, a byproduct from another industry. Um, but they all give the same amount of methane per kilogram of dry matter intake as pasture. So, um, but amongst our search, we did find that forage rape uh, does reduce methane and you get about 25 to 35% less methane per kilogram of dry matter intake. So that's the methane yield. And at the same time, get the same amount of animal performance compared to pasture. And other brassicas also do this, um, not necessarily as significantly and not as statistically significant at this stage because we haven't done as much work with the others, um, but we have shown it with forage rate. Um, and one of the things that we were interested in there because it's, um, it, the animals uh, graze that. Um, the ground uh, hasn't got the same type of vegetation cover as you would necessarily on a pasture and there's a risk of increased nitrous oxide emissions as a consequence. Uh, it turns out not to be the case um, that three out of those 25% might be reduced uh, through increased nitrous oxide. So net you still get something 20 to 30% uh, a reduction in methane emissions through uh, forage rape and other brassicas uh, may give, um, maybe smaller, but will give um, effects as well. Still some more work to be done there. Um, as uh, Mark may say later, um, the total impact of that on our national inventory is actually unfortunately relatively small because the uh, crops aren't used widely and aren't used all year round. But for an individual farmer using it, they'd still want to claim that credit. And so we aim to be able to give them that um, option if, uh, if they are using those crops. We've also looked at uh, fodder beet, uh, which is, a, um, is, a, is, a, um, is like a sugar beet relative uh, that's used in New Zealand. I'm not sure what they're called in, 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 in Northern Ireland. Um, they can reduce methane yields by about uh, 40%, but you have to have them at quite a high level in the intake. And this is similar to grain. If you're below a 
about 70% and the remainder is made up of forage, um, you don't get much of a methane uh, reduction. So there's quite a tricky management uh, with the fodder beet. And there are some other issues with fodder beet that we could go into if anyone's really interested. Um, but uh, certainly there are some feed options, but they're not going to be um, the things that bring us the big gains that we're looking for. Next slide, Mark. So one of the really promising areas uh, is to use uh, compounds that inhibit the methane producing microbes. Uh, and some of you will have heard of things like uh, Bovea or 3NOP and Mutril and a number of other products that are, are out there. Um, they are not suitable, they don't work in our systems because of the way that they're mixed into feed. And that's not how our animals are fed, they're out grazing like on the what, picture behind Mark there. Uh, and uh, you have to have something, some way of um, delivering those inhibitors to them. So we're taking it upon ourselves to look after ourselves in this particular case and develop our own inhibitors that are going to be applicable to our uh, extensive or, or, or free gra uh, grazing systems. Um, importantly, some studies we've done and also some published studies have shown that you can reduce methane quite sustainably by 30%, maybe even a bit more. Uh, using inhibitors uh, with no negative effects on the animal. Uh, that's very important to us because it gives us the uh, continued impetus to carry on down this route. And we've been looking for about 10 years now, trying to find uh, suitable inhibitors. They have to be highly potent and they have to meet a whole lot of other characteristics. Um, we've identified a number of what we call classes. So these are each class is a group of chemically similar um, compounds and uh, they have the promise at least for use in our pastoral systems and at the moment uh, we're developing our best one which we call our lead at the moment uh, we can't tell you too much more because uh, there's some co um, commercial sensitivity around all of that but we're developing it um, for delivery uh, through a feed supplement in the shed so the animals get milked and they would perhaps uh, eat it there or probably uh, most enticing for our system is through a slow release device that uh, dwells in the rumen. And uh, we're trying to refine those chemical inhibitors to uh, modify them to make them more potent so the dose can be lower. And that also increases the longevity of the capsules. Uh, and we're aiming for over 100 days or even longer. We'd love to go much longer than that so that there are fewer interventions uh, by the farmer and maintaining that methane knockdown. Um, there are a lot of other steps involved, which we are sort of just starting to move into because you know we're, we're excited about what we've got. Things like persistence, how long does it last? Will it last for, for multiple years in the animal? Um, not saying any one capsule, but does the effect last uh, on repeated dosing? Uh, safety, all the safety aspects for the animal, animal performance, is it maintained or even enhanced, enhanced? Are there any residues in the products? And also very importantly is product quality. Um, you wouldn't want any detrimental changes to the meat or the milk. Um, and preferably you'd like them to be improved in their quality, uh, make them more attractive to consumers. And this is a long game. Uh, we know this from talking to other people in this game, in this in this field. Um, getting it onto the farm is a long time after you've even got through this, the the first lots of bullet points. Um, there's a lot of things to think about, like refining your delivery mechanisms. You've got to show all of your production impacts. Everyone knows what exactly what's going on, and all the the safety and regulatory steps that are required um, by government agencies and by the marketplace and to also to convince uptake. Um, and that's to say nothing about uh, production um, of the, of the uh, capsules or the inhibitors and, and your whole marketing and, and um, network for um, dissemination of that to the farmers. So, uh, but you know, we, we know what's in front of us and we have, we have a bit of time. Um, this is what our program looks like at the moment. We can answer some more questions within what we can disclose on that. Next slide, Mark. So 
the anti-methane vaccine is probably, it's often referred to here as the holy grail or the, the moonshot. Um, it's the most enticing, but heck, it's, it's hell of a difficult science. It's been really, really hard. But we haven't given up on it yet because um, we've, we're actually trying to show or see if it won't work. And we can't show why it won't work. So it just means there's something there and I'll just take you through how it works. Um, so we're still very enthusiastic about this uh, particular technology and we think we can make it work. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to vaccinate animals uh, to stimulate their immune system so that antibodies, so antibodies are things that fight nasty microbes um, so that they get delivered into the saliva and then they go into the rumen. And so uh, a cattle beast can produce something like 100 litres of saliva a day that goes into the rumen, and that'll carry antibodies continuously into the rumen where they'll interfere with the activity of the methanogens, the methane-forming microbes. And of course, for us, vaccination's already used, so it's relatively easily integrated into our farming systems. And our target is greater than 20% reduction. We don't know how high it can go, but you know we're, we're setting our sights on something that's going to be meaningful. We know we can induce the antibodies in the saliva. Uh, those antibodies do get into the rumen. Uh, those survive in the rumen environment. And we know that we're getting enough antibodies targeting the methanogens produced to target and hit all of the methanogens in the rumen. So at the moment, we've we've done quite a few trials or a few trials, and we're trying to understand why we don't get the methane reductions in the vaccinated animals. So we're doing that in a very, very scientific systematic basis, often going back to quite fundamental knowledge and saying, is there something we've just missed here? Uh, and then we, we overcome that. And as we go through, um, we haven't exhausted all of it yet. We're working systematically through, but we haven't seen any reason why it can't work. And we've got some ideas now just in the last few months of what those issues might be. And we're working on uh, overcoming those and, and making the, the vaccine uh, to be an effective one. Um, vaccine is a little bit less tricky to get onto the market. We've been told five to seven years when we talk to, uh, to companies about this. Um, and again, so the same types of things that you're interested in, production impact, safety and regulatory steps but uh, generally a vaccine is a bit easier because the uh, residue issues don't uh, raise their head because of the nature of the intervention. Over to you, Mark. Right, one slide to go. Just picking up on a couple of things we, we probably just haven't, the productivity, when we've ever talked to farmers about reducing methane or greenhouse gases, number one is, will it affect productivity? And that is really very front of mind of all of our programs that Peter's just run you through. Um, the evidence is starting to mount about what impacts. We were, we were always concerned in our early years that if we shut down the methanogens and stop methane production, we'd close down fermentation. That doesn't seem to be the case. And um, really you've got to have long-term trials and some long-term solutions that can actually give you a feel on that productivity. So the genetics is kind of pointing that Things are looking okay. Bit of work coming out around the world that uh, longer term methane reduction hasn't taken productivity out. So certainly it has to be neutral. It will be a very hard sell if we were impacting our productivity. The last slide before we get into questions is uh, this one here. Hewaka Ekenor, um, which is Māori for uh, translated to yes, we're all in the canoe together is talking about a five-year partnership that's just been put in place in the last uh, uh, 12 months, probably, uh, of industry, government, and Māori uh, as a collective commitment to reduce agricultural emissions. Uh, you might recall in my earlier statement, we've not been inside the emissions trading scheme uh, facing a cost. Um, the government were proposing to put us in and make us face a cost without any solutions. A commitment by the industry in partnership said, well, before you put a cost on agricultural emissions, let's try and get something that's going to work for people to incentivize them to change. So this last slide is just giving you a, a flavor of where the industry, the people involved with agriculture are working with government on this. So the Hewaka Ekanoa aims to equip farmers and growers to reduce emissions, maintain or increase sequestration and adapt to a changing climate and 
sequestration is certainly in the trees as aspect of carbon capture rather than in the soils, but we're working on the soils because we really don't have the numbers to back it at the moment. Um, what it expects, the commitment expects is for all farmers and growers, and it is agricultural wide, not outside livestock, but most of our emissions come out of livestock industry, um, <coughs> is the ability to change and reduce their emissions um, and have uh, on-farm plans and to calculate net greenhouse gas emissions and, and be incentivized to take actions on climate change on their farms. And so there will be a commitment by the industry to actually for every farmer over the next two to three years uh, to actually have a, a farm plan about climate change and about reduction, reduction of emissions and actually have their greenhouse gas number. You can't actually do anything about it unless you know what it is. Um, and so those last, the last bullet point, the work streams kind of reflects the focus that uh, the commitment is looking at. So uh, farm plans, emissions reporting, on-farm sequestration, uh, emissions pricing, which incentivize people to make changes rather than just being a tax. Uh, we, have an, a, a, we have a dim view on just paying taxes for taxes sake. Um, Māori, Farming and agriculture, Māori uh, land holdings, around 20, 20 odd percent of the agricultural industry is farmed uh, by Māori. And um, extension and innovation is what you just heard. So if this all works, that is the end of our presentation and we're happy to field any questions. So, got it. Gentlemen, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you spelled it out in, in layman's terms, as I would say, which is good for people like me who, who are not uh, too well briefed in the science stuff. And uh, another just compliment of your presentation, you were straight talking where, where you just said outright right, that uh, efficiencies won't get you so far and, and this and that. And so it's, 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 it's good to hear that. We have a few questions in, in the Q&A. So folks, please keep them coming in there. We'll just wrap them through shortly. Just um, if I could ask one to Peter there, just to kick things off. I, 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 standard uh, question for myself is I think it's probably a stupid one but just on, on when we talked there about how we can have different feeds to reduce methane emissions when you said those figures to say like using grain you can potentially reduce it by 50 percent is that reduced methane emissions in absolute terms or is that in terms of per kilo dry matter intake so well it's actually both so you get, um, if the animal's eating more or less the same amount of feed energy intake for the same production, you'll get less methane and less methane per kilogram of dry matter intake. The numbers will be different slightly depending on which way you calculate it, but you will get, you will get less gross methane and less uh, methane yield, which is grams of methane per kilogram of dry matter intake. Okay, uh, that's right, good yeah. And uh, yeah, so we usually talk on that. In Northern Ireland, we would sometimes, uh, figures in industry, and particularly in the dairy industry, would throw the one out, that, throw one out where they say, you know, greenhouse gas intensity, you know, per kilo of milk produced has reduced by, I think, this on, I'm not full sure, I think it's 30% or something on the figure, roughly since 1990. And that's effectively because milk yields per cow have increased. So, uh, does it stand up to scrutiny going out of that way? I'm pretty sure in absolute terms, it's probably increased, has it? Um, well, in New Zealand, certainly, uh, while the efficiency has increased, the um, uh, amount of feed eaten and the number, of, basically, and the number of animals has increased, or at least stayed steady over the last years, was increasing. Um, so yes, the, uh, at the in New Zealand, those efficiency gains haven't reduced the absolute amount of methane towards the targets that we're um, looking for. And so that's why we're looking for these absolute emissions. You've got to decouple so pretty much, um, there are efficiency gains through uh, improved nutrition and, and, and um, improving your feed quality, but pretty much um, production is controlled by the amount of feed that goes in and methane is controlled by the amount of feed that goes in. And what we're trying to do is decouple the methane from the feed without decoupling the production. 
Okay, right. Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask that. Just a term Mark used to start decouple. So that, that that's that's where that actually comes from. Okay. Um, yeah. I think Mark might have something. Uh, yeah. So, so so since 1990, agricultural emissions have gone up about 17 percent. If we think about the whole sector. Um, the sheep and beef sector with those numbers that I showed you at the beginning have gone from 60 million down to 29 million. Um, the dairy's gone from three and a half up to six. And so that, that kind of crossover. Our whole, our whole economy has gone up 24%. So agriculture has not expanded its emissions as fast as the rest of the economy. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of where the efficiency, but our, our level of production, we are sending the same amount of meat around the world as we did with, the, you know, Pretty much, I think, as, as we did with the, you know, we had lighter carcasses, more of them, and, and all of those factors play in. But the gross emissions actually hasn't gone down, and it's about warming. So it's about emissions into the atmosphere, which is what we've got to kind of nail. So hence the decoupling and changing that relationship. And I think it's pasture, it's about 21.9 or 22 grams of methane per kilogram of dry matter. I think grain is something 16 to 18 grams of. Uh, methane per kilogram of dry matter or some some kind of range like that. But as Peter pointed out, grain doesn't cut it for us. We're, it's a small part of a supplemented feed. Yep. Um, we have, we have uh, quite a few questions here. I almost re re pushed it so much in the Q&A uh, coming in, but please keep them coming. We'll try and, and rattle through them. Uh, one question here from uh, there's no name. Just what is the mechanism that causes some animals to produce less methane? given it's the room of microbes to produce it. And yeah. can I just even just add a, a very simple question onto that? Um, the methanogens in a ruminant, are they actually even necessary? You know, like, like assume when you're, when you talk, but you don't want to constrain production, are, I think they're probably not, are they? They're just a, a byproduct or? Yeah, okay. So first of all, about the methanogens, they, um, so they use this hydrogen that's formed. It is important generally for the fermentation that the hydrogen doesn't build up too much but um, because it theoretically in a test tube it can inhibit the fermentation but um, in the animal when you knock down the methane that's not what happens you don't get all of that hydrogen doesn't just accumulate and affect the uh, the fermentation um, the, uh, the that energy or at least the the, the, the electrons is, is what we actually are talking about but that say that energy it's diverted into other um, pathways and so it's not all going to hydrogen so it certainly seems that you can knock down methane by around 30 or 40 percent and not affect the fermentation i think that's really important for us because otherwise we, we might as well give up and go home mm -hmm. um the mechanism for the sheep is actually one of the things we've studied quite well because we really wanted to understand and have confidence in what we were doing and also understand the limitations of, of breeding. Now, I'm not saying this is going to happen in cattle, but this is what's happened in our sheep breeding program is that those animals have a smaller rumen. Um, they don't have less production. They don't eat any less. They just eat in a different way and the passage through the rumen is different and that changes the dynamics in the rumen it changes the internal environment in the rumen and it sets up different types of microbes and the net mix of those microbes makes less hydrogen and therefore you get less methane so you're just directing the fermentation away and that's what some feeds do too for example grain does essentially that it's directing the fermentation in a different way uh, so that you get less hydrogen formed. And, and that's what's happening in these low methane sheep. The, the rumen is, has different size and it's changing the dynamics inside the rumen. So um, uh, we've not seen any production um, consequences of that, uh, which is a good thing. But as I said in, when I was talking about it, we'd want to keep an eye on that because uh, the, the joke we use is if you bred them right away so there was no room and we'd have a woolly pig and that's not what we're after. Okay, so just uh, Peter, I think you actually answered the next question from uh, Stephen who asked, is there any impact of low, um, of, uh, low methane lines on fat levels or dry matter intake in the sheep? So I think the answer there is no so far. Um, a little bit leaner. If you think they're a little bit leaner, 
a uh, little bit more wool growth, um, but uh, you know these are trends rather than significant differences. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, and we're always, I just say, we're also always very cautious about extrapolating because our flock is quite small. So, uh, you know, the direct measures, um, the other measures that we make is by genomic extrapolation to, to genetically similar animals and looking at them. So, you know, it's, we can say it's trends, but we wouldn't want to go out there and say, yes, you're going to get this at this stage. Yeah. Um, a question here from, um, are, you, are you doing any work on farm management effects on carbon se 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 sequestration? Um, I suppose that, that is something that we do talk about quite a bit in Northern Ireland that we're keen to look at. Um... There's work happening in New Zealand. We've, we, currently, there is a massive survey. We don't actually know what our soil carbon levels are. We've got some studies that sort of show that they're, they sit, they could go down by 1% to 2% or they could go up by 1% to 2%. Um, we've got pretty young soils that have still got quite high carbon levels compared to some of the rest of the agricultural sectors around the world. Um, Sort of, we talk about a seven percent um, carbon level in our soils on average, and much of the world's at three. We just don't have that that kind of long long agricultural history of running it down. Um, it's not an area we work in uh, directly, um, but it's certainly work that the Hewak Ekanoa and looking at that. You know, we are looking at trees. We're looking at seeing you know how a farm business can actually manage its complete carbon um, budget, if you like, um, as a as a country, and what the options will be. Obviously, with a hill country farm with lots of different terrain, you've got more opportunity perhaps to use trees in your, in your mix than a flat dairy farm that wants to has, has just got a milking platform. Yeah, so um, the soil carbon work, so we haven't presented everything that's going on in New Zealand and we're not involved in everything that's going on in New Zealand. The work is coordinated though, which is a good thing. Um, the NZAGRC is doing some work on soil carbon. Uh, so that's that sort of in the tent as it were with us. Um, one of the, the difficulties with soil carbon as Mark mentioned is the measurement. And uh, in New Zealand, we can have uh, um, a few wet years and then, a, and, and then a drought. And then during the drought, the soil carbon will drop. And then in the wet years, it'll accumulate again. And um, this long-term study that Mark is talking about, we're just trying to get an idea of what the trend is on different soil types and different terrain types. And, and because, you know, the normal, the normal thing is you get three years worth of study or five years worth of funding to do some work, and it's just not gonna cut it. These, these are going to have to be 30 year programs to try and get an idea of what's going on. So the intention is now to have a really long look uh, and understand the trajectories of, of that before a commitment is made, because obviously, um, you know, you want to know whether it's going up or, or down. Um, we think our farming practices are quite good. Uh, and we try to look after our soil because after all, that's what farmers, you know, a lot of farmers say they, they farm the soil that produces the, the grass that feeds the animals that gives them their livelihood. Um, but uh, in terms of um, yeah, the actual trajectory, that's going to take some time. And in terms of trees for sequestration, then you're really hitting a political, <laughs> it's a political hot potato, that one. Um, I don't think I'd like to say too much about it, but Mark may want to <laughs> say something. Uh, yeah. No, it's carbon. I think the one rule for soil carbon we have in New Zealand is if you're more cover, you, the, the longer you have your past, you're like, you know, where does soil carbon come from? It comes from photosynthesis. So minimizing the amount of, of time between crops and between things is an issue here. Uh, droughts will mean you don't have pasture cover or you know, um, plant cover over your land. That's when you start to lose. It's very dynamic. I think that's about the only rule we've got is to sort of minimize the amount of time that uh, we've got bare soil because that opens up the losses. But yeah, it's a, it's a work on for us. Um, on, the, on the targets there, Mark, too, you talked about at the start, just a basic question again, but why was methane given a lower reduction compared to CO2? It was it just because of the role that agriculture has in the, in the, in the economy in New Zealand? Well, I think it, it's, uh, it's, it's probably a political and one that we're all scratching our heads somewhat on, because, uh, but they are treating the saying if you've got a separate target for methane, um, we... In a warming sense, we can manage, if we can manage to take methane down, then we won't cause as much warming. But for the globe, 
you have to have CO2 at zero and nitrous oxide at zero. And so um, the split gases is, is looking to have a, a, you know, not all one, all roads lead to one. So it's just trying to reflect the warming. I think that policy is still being worked through, but um, that's the reason we've done it. Um, <clears throat> and methane is tough. If we had a methane to zero by 2050, we wouldn't do it. We can't do it. I mean, our, you know, it is a very, very hard uh, target. And, and that's really, it has been, you know, at least to manage that. I think agricultural industry is probably okay with the 10%. We're getting pretty nervous about 22 to 47, though. That's uh, the only lever New Zealand farmers have to reduce emissions today is to reduce the numbers of animals they've got. Um, and they do like to think they're in a long-term business and they're uh, in the business for, you know, so reducing the size of your business to go to stay out of the float doesn't make a lot of sense. So that's the reason it's in there. Um, is to give us the focus um, and, and have separate targets. And you can a little bit in your presentation there, just it, the, 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 the industry is not minded completely sticking with the low input grass based system. Just a question here from someone saying should, should the farmers just be aiming for a smaller herd, producing more milk per cow, perhaps using some supplementary or some more supplementary feeding or more to begin with? Um, um, well, we probably we've got a pretty strong ethos of growing our own feed as much as we can inside our, you know. So we 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 top up our pasture curve with with forage crops. Don't bring in a lot of supplements across the system. More in the dairy industry than um, and then and and really the whole drive for efficiency is to to make the best use of the of the pasture you um, grow on your property or or the feed that you can grow on your property, should I say and manage your nitrogen surplus. So you don't use too much nitrogen for the nitrous oxide side of it. Um, we're an unsubsidized industry. There is no subsidies in the New Zealand economy. Two to 3% of our economy is subsidized. And you guys today have probably seen that in that research and development as a subsidy. So we, we are up against it in that sense that we don't have a kind of a broad economy that can move some of those funds across to make those supplements cost effective. We, we uh, live and die on the market of the world and that's what makes us kind of be as efficient as we can. If you're cutting, carrying and bringing in supplements, there's a cost to that. And so I think that's where we kind of land with it. Can we do it inside our own um, individual farm businesses? But yeah, there's more supplement and milk volumes and milk prices will drive farmers to, to make as much production as they can uh, we're trying to align ourselves well with the with the world market, so we don't get caught by that. Um, just use, the presentation is obviously focused on methane. Just if you could, uh, is is there some work being going on to on nitrous oxide and just in that? Um, or is that? Yeah, look, the nitrous oxide is part and parcel of reducing the amount of nitrate, the nitrogen surplus kind of language I used uh, in on farms just now. Um, there has been quite a bit of work in New Zealand using nitrification inhibitors, which are compounds you can apply to the soil and stop the transformation of ammonia nitrate, nitrate to uh, nitrogen to uh, the nitrate to nitrate and nitrous oxide. Um, we did actually have a product released into New Zealand and was on the market being used. Uh, there wasn't a codex for that, um, and it was a residue was found in milk uh, in an international market, and that closed that market off. Uh, so there are some 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 real challenges with the, that approach, <clears throat> but um, the other side of it is to reduce the amount of protein that's being fed to our ruminants. Our pastures, by that by their nature, um, a ruminant needs about twelve or thirteen percent crude protein. They're getting offered seventeen percent in every mouthful. So there's a lot of nitrogen passing through the system, and um, Maybe the use of maize silage or some other crops like that, which have a lower end, could offset that. But again, that's a supplement, that's a new cost. So that's the work. It's pretty tough uh, nitrification inhibitors. There is some pastures, uh, plantain, which is a pasture uh, herd that's used, is showing um, some promise of being able to be utilized um, if you get 20 to 30% plantain in your sward. So it's a grazed. It sits in your pasture sward. Uh, there is some indication that that will have an impact on nitrous oxide emissions, uh, and that works just ongoing. Um, so 
those are the kind of nitrification inhibitors, plantain are kind of the two uh, major technologies that we're uh, focusing on, as well as the management of how do you lower the amount of nitrogen passing through the, the ruminant system. And, and just a, a very basic terms again, would that come back to uh, uh, ammonia as well? Ammonia emissions, that, that's a, a huge problem in Northern Ireland, and would that surplus, reducing that surplus nitrogen affect that? No, ammonia is one of the pathways to get nitrous oxide. We don't have that. We don't have uh, those kinds of conditions and those kinds of regulations. We are getting regulations in waterways, and that's come in in the last five to six years in, across the country. And we now have nitrogen caps in most landscapes, uh, which affect the uh, farm businesses that use a lot of nitrogen, um, which is the dairy industry compared to the sheep and beef. Um, so. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's coming in, but ammonia is not an issue that we, we worry. I think an island in the South Pacific where the wind blows from the west to the east, uh, the ammonia doesn't last very long in the year. It's, it's, it's whipped out to sea pretty quick. Yeah. In our system, most of the problem is for nitrogen is the is urea or in the urine or maybe applied. Um, it's broken down to ammonia, but it's very quickly uh, uh, metabolized further to, uh, to nitrates. And then those nitrates uh, are leached into groundwater or washed into rivers, or you get in that process, um, if you get um, the first of all uh, um, nitrification from the um, ammonia to the nitrate, and then if it gets wet and then the nitrate gets goes back to, uh, to ammonia, that's when you get your nitrous oxides formed. So it's really the nitrate that's our issue. Um, and it's the amount of nitrogen that goes into the system and it gets converted to nitrate and it's during all those conversions to and from nitrate that we have the problems. So as Mark said, the, you know, the, the, the ways around this are, can you find pasture species that, that um, maybe use the nitrogen more effectively or inhibit the microbes that transform it in unwanted ways? Um, are there chemical inhibitors that you can apply as like a, like a fertilizer really, but um, that inhibit the, uh, the microbes that produce the nitrous oxide, or can you manage your farm or your animals in a way that minimizes the uh, nitrogen wastage? And it's that nitrogen wastage that leads not only to nitrous oxide, but all the other unwanted things like um, uh, nitrogen pollution. And uh, so farmers are going to be driven by that whole nitrogen picture rather than just the nitrous oxide. Um, there is just the other one is there is just emerging some science around whether milk urea is an indicator and whether you can have genetic selection against that to reduce the amount of uh, nitrogen that's being uh, come flows it flows out through the urine so um, that's a piece of work I think CRV and breed are the, are the the people who are driving that kind of selection but uh, it's just really emerging and, and that might be something for genetics into the future. That's what we're going rightly over time, but I think we we'll still have most people are sticking with us. I think if two more questions left, please. Just uh, a quick one here. Just so, it's, say if, if we get uh, the technologies rocking, we can reduce methane emissions. How are we going to incentivize farmers to adopt it on their farms? Is it through bringing methane into the emission trading scheme, or taxation, or incentives, or subsidies, or how are you actually going to get these technologies rolled out? Well. Ultimately, we'd like to see that it, our understanding of the rumen and, and, and actually enhance productivity and makes us better farmers. And so it, you don't need to bring out the, the sticks and the carrots. Um, for us here in New Zealand, um, there is discussion and that's what the uh, Hewaka Kanara is looking at a pricing scheme that sort of would, would, to put us on a trajectory to reduce our emissions, to take up some of these technologies. Um, but ultimately, um, we've got to see that some benefit flows to the farmers themselves. Um, and um, that's the challenge we've got. If you can do these things um, and the market requires us to do that, I mean, to keep our ruminant, um, we know that ruminants are, are getting somewhat of a bad rap for the amount of, because uh, they do their na by, by their nature and the wonderful things that they do of turning hard to digest plants into meat, milk and fibre. Um, there is a, there's a cost to it. So I think we are hoping that uh, there will be a small amount of cost, maybe just to help focus people's uh, view, uh, you know, focus on it. But ultimately, it's got to help the farm business. Um, 
And if it doesn't do that, it's going to be a very hard hard yield. And that's when the you know, taxation is. And the emissions trading scheme should should drive behaviours to to favour low carbon um, alternative behaviours. And that's that's hope, hopefully how it will be set up. So the argument we have is the um, discussion about point of obligation, whereas uh, the point of obligation currently is at the processing plant, so at the milk and meat processing plant. Um, if you want farmers to change their behaviour, that point of obligation and the ability to, uh, to get credits or to uh, face um, costs needs to be at the farm level. And so that brings a, le a, a, a level of complexity, which I think the government's quite aware of. You've got about 200 and something um, processing plants and milk and meat or maybe less than that. So they versus uh, 25,000 or 28,000 farmers. And so there are some administrative challenges in here if you go to the farm level, but if you go at the farm level, the individual will either benefit and will make choices that affects them. And that's really, when it comes back to it, where do our emissions come from? The emissions come from farm businesses running ruminant livestock and they're the ones that have to make the changes. So we, we are trying as much as we can through here, Waka Kanawha, to, to get people understanding their numbers. And we have a lot of faith in the power of uh, New Zealand farmers to be innovative and New Zealand industry to be innovative and actually respond to those things. Um, and, you know, not beat, you know, we this is the world we live in. Uh, we've got, we all know that fossil fuel is what's driving climate change, not ruminants, but we uh, want to make sure we contribute effectively. I just follow up on that. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah. Um, if you see our, te <clears throat> our technologies, um, most of them are actually auditable, which I think is also important if you want to have an obligation at the farm level. So a farmer can say, look, this is my genomic profile of my flock. That means I've got this amount of methane less than the average or, or, or whatever. Um, I yeah. bought some shots of a vaccine, you know, that they reduce methane by 30% for one year. I bought so many capsules, they each reduce methane by 30% for 200 days or whatever the, you know, the certified um, uh, um, utility of each of those technologies is. That's immediately audible through receipts or vet um, document, veterinary documentation and so on. So we, we have had that in the back of our mind always, you know, um, there are technologies that are easier to audit. And if you want to encourage people to take them up, they have to have some incentive. And if there's a cost to carbon and you can provide a simple way of auditing it, it should uh, encourage the farmers to take it up as well. So it's been always part of our thinking that it's all very well having a technology, but someone has to get recognized for using it. Otherwise it didn't really happen. Um, lads, we're, we're going rightly over now, but uh, um, we have quite a few questions here. I think I've, I've hopefully boxed a few of them off. Uh, some of them are quite similar and your answers have been very comprehensive and the, you've actually answered some uh, questions without being asked, so which is good. I think we'll leave the very last question of the evening. It came from your fellow countryman, David Porter. Um, I think it's, it's a good one, to be honest. So we have genetics, vaccines, uh, feed and inhibitors. I want to ask both of you, is which one would you bet the farm on? What's, what's going to work? <laughs> I'll go first, Mark, and I'll let you wrap up as the uh, as the boss of the whole show. Um, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to say um, so. Pointed out earlier that you know things like the vaccine are really hard, um, uh, and we're still investing in it. Uh, things like the feeds um, don't have a big impact. We're still working in that area. Um, what we do is we look across and say, what's the likely impact, the likelihood of success and the cost of maintaining it? And, and many, when you do that cost benefit, they all come out pretty much similar. So you say, that's why we haven't dropped them. I think when I started 13 years ago, I think there were 11 technologies under discussion or under investigation, and we're down to four. And we know that for different farm systems, different ones are going to be useful, required. Um, some farmers won't want to touch a, an inhibitor because that's not their farming system. Um, so we want to offer options and also um, open up. So I'm going to say I'm not going to put, bet my mortgage at all on any of those. Um, we, we know we do, we've got a strategy here to increase our likelihood 
of producing something that is useful and potentially producing multiple uh, mitigation technologies to give farmers options and maybe they'll be stackable as well. So sorry, I didn't answer the question, but that's, <laughs> that's a, a good answer to a lot of loopy pass. Okay, I, I've got it right. <laughs> Since it's David, he'll, he'll understand the analogy. I think there's a bit of rugby played in your part of the world. Um, look, who would I bet think? It depends on our targets. If we've got a 10% by 2030, um, that's a 1% a, that's a, a, a year. Uh, probably genetics uh, in the sheep is kind of starting to accumulate. If we can get the uptake and, and the adoption, it, it's, it's probably certainly going to be worth something to tick away with. Um, our understanding of uh, forage crops gives us a small amount too, and if, and if supplement feeds growing inside the, the, uh, the fence, inside your farm boundaries could be enhanced, then you might have some options there uh, as well. But if you're getting 22 or 47% uh, kind of targets to reduce methane, then the inhibitor approach where we know what we can target enzymes is there is you know proven ability to do that. The delivery mechanism is a challenge, but um, and making sure they're benign is kind of part and parcel. So I think that's still a reasonable bet in the sense of covering off the inhibitors. Um, and the and with the vaccine, it is we haven't seen the evidence that says it won't work. And we've seen the in vitro laboratory thing that it does impact methanogens. Uh, so we're hopeful on that. You probably would put less money on it until we actually go through the proof of concept and proof of function. Um, but look, I think they're still well worthwhile. And um, how much do we need to reduce methane is really going to depend on the rest of the world turning itself off oil and coal and the whole 1.5. I mean, Paris was about keeping it under 1.5 warming. So I think having all four, we've got diverse animal um, farming systems in New Zealand, we need to have all four. The small ones are probably easy, they're here now, many respects, but the big ones are still worth going for. So I'm not sure I would, I think I'm with Peter, I don't think I'd put the farm on them um, because farm's there to do a lot of other things, it's not to bet on technologies. But you know, the one thing we don't have in New Zealand is genetically modified approaches. We're a GMO free country. There is a lot of discussion about whether that might change and whether that could give us accelerate some of these other technologies uh, even more effectively. I don't. I think the jury's out on that, and and we're working through it. But kind of that's where we haven't. We don't. We still don't feel like a, it's a, it's an impossible dream. I think it's a it's a long hard one, but we, we are making progress. Gentlemen, that is excellent. Hey, if it was some great feedback, even in the Q&A, just present presentations. And so just on, on behalf, behalf of NIAS, just really uh, thank you very much hey, for, for taking the time to speak this uh, excellent presentation and for answering uh, questions. Uh, uh, folks, also just thanks to, to, to everyone who, who did in this evening. Um, we ran slightly over time, but it was well worth it. And uh, again, as some NIAS non-members on this evening, do get in touch with us if you'd like to, to become part of the institute for uh, future events and that so uh listen everyone peter mark thanks again thanks everyone for, for dialing in and i uh, hope everyone at home enjoys the rest of the evening and peter mark have a good enjoy your wednesday it's wednesday morning for you so yeah thanks, no, look, it's been wonderful thanks for the opportunity and look if you've got some burning questions there peter that you want us to kind of have a crack at um, we're happy to deal we're happy to field those and, and send you back an email response um glad you're of interest good luck it's not a not that hard out here, but it is pretty tough. And uh, so, you know, enjoy, enjoy, and have a crack at it. That's great, man. Thanks again. Hey, sure, we'll be in touch. All the best. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye.